Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me from Kennesaw State is my friend Brian Steele Wills. Brian, how you been? Oh, I'm doing great. How about you? Are you doing doing well? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for good. asking. I appreciate it. Very good. Very so good. it's it's uh, it, it feels like spring's waking up, which means Civil War season is right around the corner. So I'm doing real well. It will good. Good. So now. One of the things that uh, f- people sometimes forget is that we Civil War historians sometimes have interests outside of Civil War. And so that's why I actually brought you in today to talk about one of your in- interests from outside the Civil War. And that relates to your brand new book. Tell us a little bit about your adventures with Charlton Heston. Well, you know, when you think about the Civil War, you can look at it from so many. You you know this from all the different uh, types of, of work you've done, where you can look at it from a battle point of view or a home front point of view, or you can look at it from leadership, or you can actually look at it from memory. Uh, you can look at it from the way the Civil War is portrayed in film or on television. And so in that respect, it, almost any part of the war is at home uh, with an audience because uh, it, it belongs. Uh, one of the things I always tell my students, if you're interested in anything, whether it's religion or politics or, or uh, you know, again, art, history, whatever it is, um, the Civil War has a place for you, has something for you. And part of this interest is a lifelong interest because I've always loved the movies. I've always liked history when it could get into a movie. And then, of course, when it's Civil War history, I've enjoyed that as much or more than anything else. And no one is the uh, epic icon of Civil War or cinematic history or anything else like Charlton Heston. Or I think about the the many iconic roles that Charlton Heston has had. Uh, what is it about him particularly that fascinated you and enough to want to spend time with him to write a biography? Well, I think one of the things you want to do is you want to try to uh, go to the movies. You want to go to something that's usually big and epics are big. And he was the king of the epics. I mean, if if it was an epic movie, he was likely to be the star of it. And because uh, he didn't like the term epic. He didn't uh, he didn't favor that. He always felt that uh, sometimes you, you had this notion of something that was not as uh, favorable to the stars and to the actors when we, when you talked about epics, like somehow the, the acting would get lost in the scenery some, somehow. But, uh, but he did love history. I think that's one of the things that I found fascinating as I studied his life more and more is how much he understood that history was at the core of the human experience. And he, and he thought that was, you know, if you're going to, study any one part of any bit of the human condition, studying history was was the central element. And I always liked that. But I love the movies anyway, and I like Civil War. So you're bl- blending them together made a lot of sense to me. And I wrote a book called Gone with the Glory, the Civil War in Cinema that uh, I enjoyed doing. And Heston's uh, couple of films were in that as well. So I love that book, by the way. I can't recommend it enough. As as a movie buff myself, your book is the book I turn to as the Bible for just enjoying the context of Civil War and cinema. Well, I didn't try to do too much with it. In other words, I get in and do the kind of analysis that, that historians or that academics love, because then you lose everybody else. Uh, we want to impress each other so we then forget everybody else. I wanted people to be able to pick it up and think, I saw that movie. I wonder how much of that has any <laughs> validity, has any connection to real history. And I tried to do that and do it in a fun way that you could pick the book up, read a chapter, put it down, come back a month later, pick it up and do another chapter and think, well, wow, I didn't know that about John Wayne, or I didn't know that about Charlton Heston or whoever it was that that chapter might reflect upon. So tell us how Charlton Heston finds his way into the Civil War. Heston finds his way in the Civil War several times in several ways. Um, he, He loved books. He loved history. So those things uh, automatically kind of turned him to historical subjects. Uh, he liked being able to um, emerge himself in any subject or topic that he took on so that if he was doing a Thomas Jefferson or an Andrew Jackson, that's who he wanted to learn as much about. And probably he he has several films that touch on the Civil War, but probably, of course, the one that matters the most as far as the Civil War community might be concerned is Major Dundee. And with Major Dundee, he was he said, I wanted to do the Civil War film that would capture the Civil War and uh, my ability to sort of 
translate that on, on screen. And I think he was disappointed that it didn't do that because, of course, you where do you find it as you typically do on the Western channel? So it's not so much viewed as necessarily a Civil War film as a Western. Yeah. And, and, you know, as someone trying to create something that's, you know, iconic as one genre to have it heaped in with Westerns, which, you know, of course, might be the ultimate of all genre sorts of pictures, seem to sort of dilute its power that way. It does in terms of trying to send a Civil War message. I mean, when he talks about the war, he's, he's knowledgeable. He, he'll he mention in some of his uh, interviews and writings about James Longstreet. I mean, how many, you know, cinema people, how many movie people talk about James Longstreet or whoever and Lookout Mountain and different things. Of course, that's not the part of the Civil War he was portraying. And in, in other areas, when he's doing readings, he really loved to gravitate towards Abraham Lincoln. I think he had a great admiration for Abraham Lincoln. So that's another one of those connections, Civil War connections, I think, that he had. When you talk about his, his interest in history, I've actually had a couple of Charlton Heston uh, encounters uh, rather unexpectedly over the past couple months. When I was down in um, Texas and I went to the uh, the battlefield where Texas won its independence and I'm watching the film and there's Charlton Heston narrating uh, the, <laughs> the story of the battle. I'm like, oh my gosh. And then uh, I was down in New Orleans and in the Cabildo at the museum they have there and suddenly I see him as Andrew Jackson, which I didn't right. realize he played that role. It's like, holy cow, there he is. It's like he's everywhere in American history. <laughs> well, he had the greatest voice. You know, one of the things he said, he had a nose that uh, because of Otto Graham and a tackle that he made back in school uh, had broken his nose. And he said, so he had that sort of iconic nose and that feature, a physical feature, but he had that great voice. And of course, he did a lot of uh, uh, different things through the years, whether it was for different government administration uh, projects. So he worked for Lyndon Johnson. He worked for, um, you know, George Bush, uh, I think is a surprising George Herbert Walker Bush is a surprising connection, but he had him through Reagan. And of course, Ronald Reagan was probably the closest connection, but every one of those, he would either be the voice of some State Department uh, 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 piece, or he would be in uh, National Park Service piece or something, it would be his voice. So I'm not surprised that he would get, uh, you know, his voice would be the voice you'd hear. Of course, he did play Jackson twice. He said that he was asked whether you want to be president. He says, I've already been president. And and he played Jackson twice. And one of them was The Buccaneer, which is the the movie where he's uh, defending New Orleans from the British and and emerging successful uh, in that uh, in that contest at Chalmette Plantation in the War of eighteen twelve actually after the war is over as you know yeah right <laughs> yeah when I was at San Jacinto and it's like that's Charlton Heston I was just yeah. uh, uh, but but I think that that also speaks to the sort of the very public service mindedness that Heston had that maybe a lot of people don't realize um, he did you know uh, tell me a little bit about that. It went, as I was mentioning a minute ago, about uh, all the different government agencies that he represented. Uh, but if it was a film festival, he would certainly be present at that. He was uh, president of the Screen Actors Guild. He was uh, the American Film Institute. You think about all the different leadership roles he played. He was on a lot of arts committees and things, again, with administrations uh, from, from uh, Lyndon Johnson on. So he stayed very active in that way. But I think what surprised me, of course, I think we all know that in the latter part of his life, he was the multi-year president of the National Rifle Association. But for all of the years of his life, he was involved in almost every kind of public service you can imagine. Again, whether it was the uh, forestry service or space or even something as small as selling Bud Light or uh, whatever. So, I mean, he was in commercials. He was in, um, you know, the, the different projects. And so uh, he was in a lot of things. I think, again, one of those parts of his public service life that people don't realize was that he was the head of the Hollywood contingent that went to the March on Washington with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, so, and I want to talk about that that um, second act of his with the NRA, which is mm -hmm. it's fascinating stuff. But, you know, for a long time, he was sort of thought of as like one of those liberal Hollywood elites and hanging out with LBJ and civil rights stuff. And, and that's a much different perception than people had of him later on in life. 
Um, so w- when I think about his interest in history, how do you apply that to like some of his uh, sandal and toga epics uh, of his career, which are also very historic based? Well, I was going to say about the others that he was really probably never, quote, liberal, unquote. He was always pretty conservative and pretty basic, but he was just one of those, um, he was one of those people that never let uh, a specific position define him. So he was not afraid. He had a lot of uh, strong progressive and liberal friends that he was very close with, uh, but he was not, uh, you know, a hail fellow well met. He was kind of a private person. I think that is true of a lot of Hollywood types that they're not as as open as you think they are. They're more private and uh, he would always consider himself a shy person. So uh, politically, I think he thought he skewed the middle libertarian kind of and, you know, conservative, definitely. And he, he'd say, I started supporting the Democratic Party, but then the Democratic Party moved. I didn't. Yeah. And so I think he felt like that was a part of what happened is that uh, that uh, the party that he had been connecting himself with, although he preferred and I think he always believed that he was a political independent I think he would argue that uh, probably as, as strongly as anything that he did not feel beholden to anybody. So, um, so how is it then he ends up being someone that we associate with with Ronald Reagan, who's got this sort of um, you know ultra conservatism that that he brings back you know to the national political stage, um, and, and Heston's very much associated with part of that because of his uh, relationship with the NRA. Well, you're back again, kind of at two different time periods. The NRA period's a little bit later in his life. Um, his interest with uh, with Ronald Reagan, of course, skewed across the Hollywood spectrum because uh, he would know him from the time they were both negotiating for various things within the Screen Actors Guild. In fact, he watched him one time and he said, this is a leader. And he watched his, his uh, skills at negotiating, his ability to stay up through the night to accomplish what they had all hoped to accomplish and bring different groups of people together in a common cause and end up finding a solution when sometimes it didn't appear at the front of that process that that was even going to be possible. And I think he admired that in in Ronald Reagan. But he also saw Reagan's uh, interest in politics as sort of the fire in the belly kind of thing. And he would say, I didn't have that Irish fire like the Kennedys, and I didn't have the fire like uh, Ronald Reagan displayed. So that's one reason he said, I'd rather play president than be president or play a senator than be a senator. So let me swing back to, to the my, my question a second ago about his uh, his sandal epics and and right. you know, that, that's reflective of his interest in history as well. Although it's a, a, a section of history that's a little disconnected from us, or a little more disconnected from us as Civil War guys. Sure. Uh, how did that? How did he come to those roles, and and how did his love of history tie into that? You know, he was one of those people that really uh, crosses a lot of lines that you don't necessarily think of because, of course, he he started acting at a time when uh, most of the actors were studio actors, and he was able to avoid being tied to any one studio, and so that was something that he didn't have to deal with. He actually had uh, served in World War II in uh, in Alaska, in the Aleutians, and when he came back, he tried uh, Broadway. I think that's, he always considered himself an actor first and trying to learn. He thought the actor's um, the stage was actor's country, and that's where you do what you need to do. And he would he performed different uh, uh, kind of roles, so it wasn't like a one type of role, necessarily historical. Sometimes they were a little more modern, although he said, I always envied Cary Grant because he got to stand around beautiful people saying beautiful things, uh, wearing beautiful clothes. And he says, I never got to do that. I was dressed in a toga or I was dressed in a, you know, a Roman outfit or whatever it was that he happened to be wearing for that particular uh, uh, project. But he he said, I'm also able to pull that off. You know, I can wear that kind of uh, of outfit convincingly, whereas uh, someone else can. And he didn't think of it as costume. He really thought of it as outfit, something that reflected what that period would project itself to be. So, you know, whatever he was doing, he studied that, he read about it. Uh, if it was a person, he studied that person's life. He read, if possible, his letters and writings. Um, he he would immerse himself in history. And the 
uh, the way we identify him with people like Moses and Ben Hur come because in his early career, you know, he was fortunate enough to be with Cecil B. DeMille. And with Cecil B. DeMille, oftentimes you got that kind of, of uh, film. Now, his first DeMille picture was actually a circus picture called The Greatest Show on Earth. And uh, he played a circus uh, wrangler, the man in charge, the manager in charge of the circus. And he said the greatest compliment he ever got was someone who wrote in and said, well, I admired the role of Betty Hutton and, and Cornell Wilde and uh, Jim, Jimmy Stewart. He says, but I thought that that circus manager fit in with the rest of the actors really well. <laughs> <laughs> So he thought that was great that they didn't recognize him as an actor. They recognized the role he was playing and how well he fit in with the, the actors. So he got a kick out of that. But but with DeMille, he ended up getting, you know, the uh, the the Ten Commandments. He get he gets Moses. That really puts him on the map with Hollywood. His first film was a, a kind of a almost like a made for TV kind of movie that uh, was uh, called Dark City. And it was really kind of a um, uh, thriller type movie where a man commits suicide and his brother ends up hunting down the people that he holds responsible. The, they cheated the fellow at a card game and and the brother comes and tries to hunt each one of them down. And Heston's the one who's uh, sort of the key figure that that uh, is holding that story together as he's being hunted down. But um and it was funny, one of the uh, ads referred to him as Mr. Excitement, which you don't think of Heston as Mr. Excitement, but I guess he was getting his start and he was catching the eye of Hollywood and the eye of the of the world. But one of the things, live television gave him a start. So Broadway, live television, and then Hollywood. It's interesting to think that he had those sorts of roots, which... Uh are much more intimate venues and acting experiences. And then we tend to think of them in these big sweeping epics. I mean, right. It's a huge, huge leap, but you know, that, that speaks to his versatility, I think. Well, I think he felt like he could do it all. And that, that his one regret was that he never had the perfect performance. And that was his goal to try to accomplish that perfect performance, whether it was on the stage or in the small screen or on the big screen. And the other thing I think he felt like that he, he got his um, his ticket punched when he could do Shakespeare. He really thought that that was what acting should be and was about. And when he got to do uh, Shakespeare in London, I mean, you know, so he, he's very much an Anglophile. He really he liked, uh, you know, the things that, uh, again, he felt identified you as a, a legitimate a practitioner of your craft. Did he did he have an inferiority complex in that regard? You know, does he need those stamps of approval? You know, it's funny. I would say, you know, certainly looking at him and thinking about him, the answer would be no. And yet, it clearly there was something in the deep and dark side of his personality that I think enjoyed having. Well, I really felt like, and I said this in the book over and over, that he was looking for an audience that he enjoyed having an audience, that he fed off an audience. And when you talk about uh, the audiences that he would have in his early part of his career because of Moses or because of Ben-Hur, uh, those were important audiences that remained with him forever because there would be people who said, I was 13 years old when I saw the Ten Commandments, and then I remembered that for the rest of my life, or Ben-Hur and the chariot race, which is what I built my uh, book off of, is the running the race, the public face of Charles. Charlton Heston, and he would say, you know, I know about my public face, I understand my public face and the uses of my public face, but he also could separate his public face from his private existence, and he kind of cherished the private existence as something apart from that, and, and that he hoped to kind of keep inviolate a, a good bit. He felt like Certainly audiences deserve to know about the actors that they watched, but he felt like it was almost as if you were kind of in two levels and and that he wanted to be protective of that one level. As a biographer, was it easy or difficult for you to get to that level based on the resources you had available to you in research? Heston gave tons of resources because you had interviews you had letters, you had different things. Um, he has a lot of material that's uh, in archives in, in Hollywood, in, in uh, 
California, there were a lot of materials in the presidential libraries, the Lyndon Johnson Library, the Bush Library, the the um, Reagan Library. I really enjoyed my visit to the Reagan Library. I got a chance. I'm kind of a president fan anyway, and I love things presidential. So when I can go to the simulated White House or I can go see the Air, old version of Air Force One or I can do that, I just I just eat that stuff up. And one of my, my wife says I collect way too many things and she's right, but one of them is campaign buttons. I have campaign buttons from a long way. I've got even some Theodore Roosevelt buttons, so. Very good. So, so now it has taken me 22 minutes. I've tried to hold off, but I've got to ask about <laughs> Planet of the Apes because that's my favorite Charlton Heston movie. Um, but as you as you talk about his interest in history, um, as I'm just thinking about it off the cuff, I mean, I see a very interesting lens to look at that movie with a, a strong sense of history for them. Which movie. which movie was that? I didn't. A Planet of the Apes. Oh, Planet of the Apes. Well, you know, it's it's like if somebody says, if you're going to have four movies you have to see that has, they're connected to him, Planet of the Apes would be one of those movies. And, you know, he reinvented himself. I don't think that's one thing he was ever afraid of doing. He did not want to be typecast. And so I think he felt like I've done successfully the Moses character maybe one ought to only do that once in a career and maybe that ought to be at the latter stage of your career as it turned out it was at the front end of his career and I've been Ben Hur and I've been El Seed and I've been uh Chinese Gordon and I've done this and I've done that but you know I think he likes science fiction I think he found that interesting I think he felt like I want to try to move in in that direction there were times I got the sense that he was trying to figure out what maybe the next big thing might be and whether he could get in on that either on the way up or while it was still riding high. So you can kind of see him in um, a lot of movies that either had just had a hit and this was sort of the follow up to that or that ended up leading and Planet of the Apes was certainly in this category leading the way so that you had all these different apes versions i was just seeing on tv the other day uh beneath the planet of the apes which he's in a little bit uh you know conquest of the planet of the apes escape from the planet of the apes battle for the planet of the apes but he wasn't in except a little piece of beneath because he did not want to be the person linked to just that and he was always interested i'm going to do this i'm going to do it the best way i can and then i'm going to move on and it's the way he is with with Will Penny, which is an outstanding Western that he's in that I don't think any that that many people really know as much about as they probably should. It shows Heston as, as really a talented uh, and nuanced actor in ways that some people kind of think of him. And he he understood this, that sometimes they thought of him as wooden. Sometimes they thought of him as being stiff because, you know, some of his characters really were sort of that that pillar of strength. Well, a pillar of strength can also be constrictive. And he understood that. But he but he was in a great movie, Soylent Green with uh, oh. Edward G. Robinson is a great movie. Um, you know, later on, um, Will Smith will be in the remake of basically the movie that Heston was, was uh, portraying himself to be the last man on earth. And goes through, uh, you know, Omega Man. He goes through uh, L.A. and streets that are empty. They had to film it really early because <laughs> there was no traffic in the streets uh, for them to uh, to have to worry about filming around. But um, and in all of those, again, I think he was trying to find that audience. Where's that? Where's that audience? Uh, he'll do Midway the same year that uh, Gregory Peck does The Omen, and uh, and Heston was considering the omen but he worried about the omen it seemed like maybe a little too much uh and he was worried about what that might do and and lump him maybe into something he didn't want to be in and then he said later on he says i wish i'd done the omen then i'd have the two highest grossing films for that year because midway which was a far more traditional historical film was uh, very popular in, in 1976 very popular uh, and and made a lot of money, and then so did The Omen. And he said, but nobody really could have pulled that off the way Gregory Peck did. He liked Gregory Peck a lot. His He really liked Laurence Olivier. That was his favorite. That was his mentor. Uh, he loved Orson Welles. He loved to work with Orson Welles. He liked the, the um, directors or actors who could bring more out in him. He thought that was always 
the best kind of person to be associated with or to be around. So the, the, the Mills and the and the uh, Wellses and the so forth, uh, William Wyler, I mean, you know, just go down the list of all the people that he felt like would make him a better actor and uh, would lift his performance higher than he might lift it himself. Now, is there a moment in his, uh, toward the end of his career, where you might put your finger on, like, here's where he's really kind of deciding to wind down. Here's how he's changing his public persona. Or would you see that more as a gradual sh sort of shift? He would say that one of the great benefits was that he did not rise immediately. It took him a long time to rise up. And I think he would say that that was probably also true of the end of his career, that it took time for him to kind of wind it down. Now, unfortunately, as I'm sure you know, you know, Alzheimer's was uh, was a nemesis he couldn't overcome. And uh, and that, of course, forms, forced him to kind of uh, wind it down. But there were times he says he don't he didn't know how a young person might uh, be able to function in acting because he says today you may be a, uh, on a Western tomorrow you may be a, a villain on Mannix. He says, and I'm glad I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to go through where I'm trying to do this role or that role just to survive or just to stay relevant until the next project can come along. And I think he felt like that choosing his roles was very important. Uh, he also ended up getting a first dollar um, the gross uh, con a contract with a lot of the things he did. So he got paid well, and especially if the if the movie or the project made uh, money, he made money. So I think, you know, he was smart about how he approached his business. He was smart about how he uh, carried out his business. But he also recognized as time went on that some of his prejudices a little bit at the height of his career could no longer hold up because I think he felt like I'm a movie star, even though he didn't like the word star and he didn't like celebrity, didn't like certain things. It's funny he would say all that. And yet um, I think he really kind of connected to that. And toward the latter part of his career, he's starting to come back to television. When he had started in television, he comes back to television. But he felt like the television roles that he would start taking had real um, production values that they didn't have at other times in his career and so that they were better now than they had been. So being in a mini series or being the star on a television show, the Colby's or whatever the case may be, not only could of course bolster your bank account, but he felt would be done appropriately and done well and then he started doing those bit parts, those cameos. And I think he did enjoy that. He didn't mind hamming. He had a great sense of humor that I don't think most people realize. He didn't mind hamming it up. When Crocodile Dun Dundee has almost an angel, he's God in it. And of course, why do you not want to be God in, if you're Moses? And, um, and he was in Saturday Night Live. But he says, I was doing stand-up on some of these old TV shows before these kids were born. So he says, so to me, it's not that big a leap for me to be on Saturday Night Live, even if they think, well, here's the old codger coming in and we're going to make fun of him. But well, he made fun of himself. He understood that. And I mentioned, you know, Bud Light and, and uh, so forth. He was on commercials that were actually aired during the Super Bowl and, and telling the story about the chariot. And he said that he loved to tell the story that the, his the, the uh, trainer, Yakima Knut, told him, said, uh, uh, Chuck, you just stay in the damn chariot. I'll make sure you win the race. <laughs> <laughs> and he would tell that story over and over. And, of course, sometimes uh, for a Bud Light audience. And then, of course, uh, have, uh, you know, a whole different group of people. He was at one time was on a Friends episode. And when they approached him about doing it, he said, friends, what is friends? Well, who are they? Who, who are friends? Well, of course, you know, he ended up knowing who the friends were. He knew what, what that was about once he was in it. But he also knew that that would bring him to an audience that didn't know who he was or didn't know much about him or that would be able to then connect maybe to their parents or to their grandparents and the movies that they had seen him in. So he was very shrewd in that sense, is always looking, like I said, for that audience to keep kind of staying relevant. What was it that, that got him involved in, in you know, I, I remember you describing it as his second act where he gets involved with the NRA and, and really becomes a very um, visible and vocal spokesperson for them. 
he loved hunting. He and he took back to his earliest youth of going through the woods, and he said that's where my imagination first got sparked, and I first started pretending to be other people or other beings because I think sometimes he was on all kinds of things in his mind and his imagination. But um, but he loved hunting, and and I think that that was part of it. It wasn't so much that he you know was this ideologue as much as he believed that one of those things that one should be able to do is, um, you know, if you believe that owning a gun is a reasonable and decent thing to do, there's nothing wrong with that, no apology. And so um, I think he felt like that uh, he was very much of a, a constitutionalist, and he certainly believed in the Second Amendment, and he believed that it deserved to be uh, protected and advanced. His argument was that the Second Amendment actually protects every other amendment, so that if you want the First Amendment with all of the rights that come with that, you you have to have the second one to protect it. And I think he really kind of combined that that his interest in politics, his more conservative nature, his interest in hunting and outdoors. And he threw all of that together and especially, again, looking for that audience. And when he found the NRA, he found an audience that really connected with him and really uh, felt uh, strongly about him. And he ended up in many ways sort of saving the organization as it was kind of moving along. And then, and then of course, advancing it quite significantly. Then, of course, he ran into some, some buzz saws, as, as the NRA would do when um, certain things happened, uh, you know, uh, shootings and other things that then, you know, you, you are interested in guns and guns kill people and, you know, get all of that. So he'd be on TV trying to defend one side of the argument, not so much from saying that he didn't agree that guns could be dangerous and bad in the wrong hands. Um, in fact, in the Johnson administration, he was one of four principal actors, all of whom had been in Westerns that said that some of the Johnson administration's attempts at trying to rein in some of this almost free wielding uh, kind of attitude toward guns uh, that that was appropriate. So it's kind of funny kind of how he did the dance through the various parts of his, his life. And I don't think he felt like he was untrue to that, to that earlier position later on with the NRA, where you have that tendency to think it's a slippery slope. And if you give on this, you're going to give on every, everything. But I do think he felt like that he evolved and that one of the evolutions was to celebrate American history, uh, celebrate American uh, independence and values and sort of exceptionalism. I don't think he ever felt like, well, as he put it at one point, he said, you don't spell America with a K. <laughs> you know, he's very strong about feeling that, you know, we don't really need to apologize for not being King George's boys and for not being, um, you know, um, for not espousing sometimes things that sometimes bring us some blowback, some trouble. I mean, you know, owning guns is going to be one of those things that some people are going to find to be problematic and they're going to hit you on it and you, you've got to decide where you stand and you've got to hold your ground as you think you should. So the book is called Running the Race. Tell us a little bit about it and where folks can find it. Well, it's a Savas Beatty, and uh, so uh, you can buy it from him. You can buy it on uh, Amazon, or uh, if you get into a bind, send me a note, and I'll send you a copy and sign it for you myself. Um, it's built off of Ben-Hur. I originally had planned for it to come out at about the time of the anniversary of Ben-Hur, and a number of things slowed that way down, and it didn't come out the way I wanted but I felt like his life was almost symbolically captured in that, that, you know, the race of, of, uh, of life and that his own life kind of took him from point to point. Uh, I, my wife and I are big horse racing fans. We love to go to Lexington, to Keeneland. And I kept thinking about different stages of the race where things are happening. And I kind of set it up again, a little bit of a horse race in mind, a little bit of the, um, 
of the iconic uh, uh, chariot race in mind and uh, his life and journey in mind. And I kind of pull, pulled all that together. So I thought uh, Ted did a great job. The cover, I think, is really a beautiful cover. It shows the, the horses and Heston's racing them to the lead and we're going to win that race. And then all throughout one chapter, for instance, is to the post, which is at the you know, beginning. And then you kind of have it sequentially sequentially go along the only um chapters that kind of merge a little bit off of each other is there was in the 60s there was so much going on that was both good and bad because he would have so many good things happening and at the same time so many terrible things happening and i don't mean just for him personally but for the country when you have so many things where you've had assassinations you've had you know, all these different issues that are happening. How did he deal with that? And what role did he play? Um, when John Kennedy was assassinated, he will come back and do some readings as part of that memorialization at the very beginning of remembering who this young dynamic leader was and, and what he represented. And when King is assassinated, I mean, it, it's, it's Charlton Heston who steps up into that situation to try to uh, make sure that the the Hollywood takes the right approach to it. And you know, one of the things I think everybody was doing was trying to figure out how do you react to these terrible tragedies and what is enough or not enough or what's too far. And I think a lot of the things uh, I always get a tickle when uh, when Heston was being considered by Dr. King himself for being on the involved in the March on Washington, there were various people that said, well, we don't really need him. You know, the Marlon Brandos were more appropriate and so forth and so on. Well, Dr. King says, we need somebody like a Charlton Heston, because if we can win Heston, we can win those people that kind of see things more from his point of view. And uh, when he heard that Heston was on board, he says, we're going to be OK now. We've got Moses. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, fantastic. Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell readers and, and or, uh, listeners and viewers, having read the book in its galleys, um, years ago, when I first met Brian, and we sat down to dinner, and he was telling me he's working on this Charlton Heston biography, and it just sounded fascinating. And Brian just lit up as he was telling me about it. So to then read the galleys and see how this project came full circle. Um, it's a delightful, wonderful book. And I'm really glad to see that it's finally in print for you. Well, I was glad to finally get it out too. It really was a labor of love. I mean, like I said, I love the movies. I loved his role in the movies. Um, I'm not trying to endorse any of his positions. The, mo the book does not do that. It just presents his life and you can make or draw from it as you wish. Uh, I will say again, as a Civil War connection, you know, I guess we all think of the George C. Scott version of the Wirtz trial and he was not in that but he was in a version, similar version of the Wirtz trial. So he had a connection to the, the sort of Andersonville trial and uh, that sort of thing. Again, that was part of his uh, connection to the Civil War. I don't think people really realize he was a prosecutor, I think, in that particular production. But he thought it was important to deal with the question of following orders and what point do following orders, does it hold you responsible or not hold you responsible for the things that occur uh, when you are following orders? And it was at a time, of course, between World War II and Vietnam, where you're asking a lot of questions about, you know, what is the kind of choice that someone has to make? And, and what do we think of that choice? And what do we think of, uh, of whether that's appropriate, inappropriate, good or bad, good or evil? So he tried to latch on, like I say, to those things he thought were meaningful. Uh, Three Violent People was really more of a reaction to uh, post-war than it was a uh, civil war because he's a, a Confederate soldier coming home. But, um, you know, he's dealing with sort of the how do you move on once the war is over? And he makes a comment at one point, I've been four years losing a war. I need to move on. So. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, before I wrap up, uh, last question, um, do you have a favorite Charlton Heston movie? People ask me that question. It's very difficult because it just kind of depends. There's elements or parts of movies 
that I love that I can see that piece a hundred thousand times. Uh, and some have been hers that way. Um, obviously, um, different ones. I mentioned Will Penny. I really like Will Penny. Um, there's a lot of different Heston roles that I thought were, you know, I enjoy. I have copies of everything, I think, or almost everything. Uh, and most of them are pretty good. Now, he loved books, so he really wanted to make the um, classic um, film uh, on given books. So one of his better interesting movies is Treasure Island, where oh, he nice. plays Long John Silver. And he really is a kind of incredible Long John Silver. Now, on the other hand, he did a Jack London movie that he says, if it's on late at night, do us a favor and just turn the channel. <laughs> <laughs> Don't watch. <laughs> so, you know, it kind of depends. I mean, he's he, like everybody else. He's got some great movies. I think probably one of my favorite emotional scenes is the uh, Soylent Green scene where Edward G. Robinson has gone to the euthanasia center and he's watching the world as he remembers it and as he would like to remember it. And Heston, who has no idea what all of this is or what it means, comes in, breaks in and ends up watching some of that with him. And it turned out that it was emotional on so many levels because not only is it beautifully filmed, it was Edward G. Robinson's last movie. He will die only a few days later after that movie wraps. So it really was his last movie. And Heston oftentimes sort of saw his mortality, whether it was the death of Ty, um, uh, well, shoot, I drew a blank, whether it's the death of Gary Cooper or some of the, these people that he knew and how that would sort of force him to think about his own mortality. Or again, like in this case, he thought, if I'm going to act, I would love it that I would go out in a dressing room or on a stage or in a film, and that would be the last thing that would happen. And unfortunately, that did not, unfortunately, did not happen for him that way. But he died in the bosom of his family, which I think he would have given as much for as anything else in life. He was very much a family-oriented man, uh, loved his, he, he and his wife had a uh, hugely successful marriage through the years in terms of length, for a Hollywood marriage. And they had their ups and downs like everybody else, but uh, because you know he never sugarcoated much. When you study or read his interviews or what he says, he's usually pretty honest and pretty open about things. So I found that refreshing too uh, with Heston, but I certainly felt like um, I captured what I wanted to say about him. I thought I, I did well to kind of at least give some people an image of the public face of Charlton Heston, which was my goal. Excellent. Brian, I appreciate you taking some time to chat with us today. The book is called Running the Race from Savas Beatty by Brian Steele Wills. And I wish you all the best with the book. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And good luck with all of your endeavors. You staying busy as ever. Every time I turn around, a new book coming out, new projects on the way. You're busy as ever. <laughs> Just trying to stay out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? I'm Chris Mikowski. Thanks for being with us here on the Emerging Civil War podcast. We'll see you online and on the battlefield. All right. <laughs>